All right, uh, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Dick Erath. We're at the Linfield University Library. It's May 27th, 2021. Dick, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, let's get you started with a nice easy question. Uh, why wine? Why wine? Uh, that's an easy question. Easy question. Yeah, well, you fall in love with it and then you, then you, you know, it's, it's uh, not even a question anymore. It's what can you do, you know? Yeah. I guess I fell in love with wine back in the, the 60s sometime. Uh, I had a really good friend who was um, an attorney in California and, and uh, actually was married to the daughter of the Giannini family, the Bank of America founder. And he, was, he wasn't Italian, but he, well, he was Italian, but he didn't look Italian. And he uh, introduced me uh, to some fine wines at his house. Yeah. And uh, I guess that started it. Do you remember your first impression when you had, when you had a fine wine for the first time? Do you remember what you, th what you thought or what, what captivated you about it? Uh, I'm trying to remember the taste right now. It's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's so intriguing, you know, that you can have th this wonderful taste of a, in a, in a beverage. I call it a, a liquid food, and and then it it then it goes from there. Every every area in the world, every grape variety produces its own little, uh, you know, morsel of food that it's different from the other morsel of food. Uh, that's a bad analogy. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I get, I get where you're going with that. So it's, and then from then on, I. Um, I was in photography back in those days. I had studied with Ansel Adams a little bit, and uh, I loved that. The, um, the, the first, I got interested in wine, in making it, because I was, now I was drinking it, and I said, you could make this, you could drink, taste this wonderful, this wonderful liquid food, how do you make it? How do you get there? And so, um, th so I had to start planting grapes out. And we lived in Walnut Creek on a three-acre uh, walnut farm, part ranch, orchard, I guess. And it, uh, the walnut trees were dying from a, a disease they get at the graft in the Union. And so I ended up where a couple of trees had died. I planted a row of Zinfandel. Um, I never did. I moved from there before they, they got. <laughs> so I, um, at the same time, I was in you know working in electronics. I, uh, the folks at Hewlett Packard uh, had a, a, a marketing company. They he didn't even have their own marketing, and it was called Keeley, Keeley Enterprises, I think. The fellow that owned that had. Um, vineyards out in Lodi, California. And, and uh, the kids were, we had one child at the time, Cal, I know you met Cal or not, and we took him and shoved him underneath a grapevine to keep him out of the sun, and we <laughs> proceeded to pick, pick, pick a pickup throw grapes and came back to Walnut Creek and made a barrel of Zinvino. But that, that, was a, that was the second barrel of wine I made. The year, year before, uh, we had been going out to Pleasanton, which is an area in the Livermore Valley, and there was a cheese factory in Pleasanton that a Greek fellow was, uh, had started, and, and, uh, and you'd go in and to buy some cheese, and, and if you were interested in a wheel of certain kind of cheese, you'd go into a tower. It was a place where you aged the cheese, and the, the um, big wheels of it were stored in a um, vertically in this tower, and he would go up and get one and core it, take a core out of the out of the wheel, and see if you liked it. And he, he, you bought a chunk out of it. I couldn't afford a whole wheel. <laughs> you bought a chunk of that that cheese, um, and then at the same time, nearby, outside of Pleasanton, was Ruby Hill Vineyards, and R Ruby Hill was started by an Italian who came from Sicily. Uh, I think he, he, 
I'm not sure what, when Ernesto got to the United States, but he was in the, right at the end of Prohibition, and as soon as Prohibition was over, he had saved up money and he he bought he bought in this old vineyard called Ruby Hill Vineyards, and there was a winery on the site, and the winery was I think built by a fellow named Wentworth, who was of old California, his historical guy, guy in, the, in grapes. And I remember the, the, it had no air conditioning, of course, and you're out, it's pretty warm down there. And the, the walls were, that's, you know, it's hard to remember exactly, but it seemed like they were like four feet thick, and they went up forever, and it was cool inside. Mm -hmm. and, and he had since sold uh, contracted with Christian Brothers to take all his fruit. But he, he and I got along fine and, he, and I would buy a, 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 his red wine that he had le left over from before he, when he had still been making wine and they bought him out, left him with some inventory. So he was selling off the, his inventory and I'd buy a, I think a gallon of really nice red wine, the Zinvidel Black Melvisia blend. It was like, I don't know, four dollars or something. T take it home and decant it into four one-fifth bottles. Spread it out, spread the wealth. <laughs> then um, that fall, I asked Ernesto, can I will you sell me some grapes? And he said, okay. And I, a friend and I went out and, uh, in a pickup truck and on a Saturday morning and, and picked Semillon out of his vineyard. Not sure what we picked him in. Got back to Walnut Creek and I, I had, you, you have the parts of the Crusher stemmer here that I had that then. And uh, made that first first barrel of wine in, the, in, in Walnut Creek. And, uh, and then I finally retired, you know, that was 60, 1965. And in 2019, I decided that was my last vintage. So I made, uh, I made wine for 55 years in a row. It's amazing. Yeah. I got lots more questions about that, but I want to back up for a second. Um, you mentioned working, uh, working in technology. Tell, tell me about what you were doing before wine. What were you doing when you were living in California? Uh, I'd been, uh, it, from a kid, I was very interested in electronics. And so I, my, I went to school and I went to work for a shell development company. And we were in what's called applied physics there. Uh, and we did all sorts of wonderful things. We, uh, it was in uh, Emeryville, California. They had a research lab there, Horton Street, 5301 Horton. And you remember that, it's the place you go to for many, seven years I went to 5301 Horton. <laughs> and we, we did things like, uh, not personally, but the, the company itself, we did, that's where uh, TCP, the additive to gasoline was invented. Uh, because it's, it stopped, you know, it stopped the pre-ignition of, of gas for air, aircraft. Um, uh, we invented epoxy, epoxy was invented there. We, we had our own, we had epoxy before anyone knew what it was. So it was interesting, exciting times. Mm -hmm. And I hated chemistry when I was going to school. Now, now I was immersed in it, so when they threw me into it, and, and I, I learned quite a bit of chemistry because of the people around me. And it wasn't that bad, it wasn't so bad that way. So then, I, then I, then I got a job offer to work for a startup electronics company, 100% electronics and no, no chemistry involved now. And so I took it, and that was out in the, uh, the Walnut Creek area, and that's when I, you know, segue back to planting the grapes and everything mm -hmm. in Walnut Creek, and then uh, Tektronics had offered me a job. Uh, and it, by that time, I knew I wanted to plant grapes, and, and I, I had uh, checked out California, the, the Santa Cruz Mountains, and uh, the area up in Anderson Valley, both of which I thought would do okay for Pinot Noir. 
but the Santa Cruz Mountains, it's all rock and very expensive because it's so close to the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. uh, further north, and they, I would have had to be a you know, Motorola repair or tell someone his TV sets because there was no industry there. So that's a good thing that Tektronics came along and offered me a job. Because <laughs> by that time I knew I was going to do something with wine. Mm -hmm. And I incurred the largest uh, moving bill that they ever had seen because I taking all my barrels and stuff from Walnut Creek and putting them in the moving van and off we went. Brought them all up. Brought them all up. At what point, you mentioned, you talked about your first couple of barrels, first couple of years in 1965, 66. Tell, tell me, at what point did you, did you know for sure that was what you wanted to do, that you wanted to put some grapes in the ground, you wanted to start making wine at a bigger scale? Um, I think I probably knew that in already in 64 before I, even before I started planting grapes. I just, uh, it was so intriguing, you know, to, to be able to uh, plant something in the ground and come out with this delicious product. And, and uh, it's still fascinating. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of magical that you can do this when you think about it. So you, you mentioned, and you mentioned Pinot Noir specifically. What, what, what was it about Pinot Noir that you were excited about at that point? Uh, the, I was fortunate enough to taste a bottle of 1955 Engelnut that Andre Chelichev had made at, uh, the, at my friend's house in San Francisco, the fellow was an attorney. And I said, this is like liquid gold. You know, it's like, uh, it's, it's just so wonderfully layered and uh, complex, it, you know, it just keeps on, the flavors just keep flowing out and, and there's nothing to, nothing aggressive, you know, no, no hard tannins to try to resolve, yet it has great staying power. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's when I got hooked on Pinot. So, as you were making those first wines, what, were the big, what was the biggest learning curve for you? What did you have to know uh, about the science of winemaking? What were some of the, maybe some of the early mistakes you made or some of the early, sort of early challenges you had? Um, I had to be patient. It doesn't happen so quickly when you, when you, you know, it isn't like, be wine, <laughs> come over here wine. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You have to be patient. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to, because uh, when I was going to school, I worked in a breweries in the summertime. And so I, the, the breweries used a place called Berkeley Yeast Labs to get their yeast, which later became, uh, um, I'll remember the name here in a minute. It's a big company now. And, uh, Scott Laboratory. Mm. And the fellow that started Berkeley Leach Laboratories was, had retired. And I got his, I'm not sure, I got his name because I knew he came, he did work at things at the winery, at brewery. He, um, Julius Fessler was his name. And he was a microbiologist, he was retired. And uh, he basically educated me about fermentation. How, how it all happens and the, the cycles and, uh, you know, when you think about it, uh, fruit is not destined to become wine, it's destined to become acetic acid and rot on the ground, you know, that's where it's, its final resting place. So what you do when you're, when you're fermenting is you're interrupting that pathway and pulling it away from that and, and, and then allowing the alcoholic fermentation to, to take place and, and not the Acetobacter thing going on. Uh, so he helped me a lot when that first barrel of Semillon I made uh, in Walnut Creek. Mm -hmm. it, uh, I, didn't, I didn't have a place to really, I didn't have a, a winery at the time. And it, that's why I called it garage wine then. I, and they still call it garage wine now because they always took over the garage and threw the cars out and put some 
do something worthwhile with a garage, you know. Your car can sit outside in the rain, you know. Not the wine. Not the wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so when Tektronix called, that was to bring you to Oregon at that point, right? That would, that, that, that's what brought you up to Oregon. Is yes. that right? Yeah. We had, we had hired a fellow from Tektronix uh, to work at our startup electronics company called Eldorado Electronics, more affectionately known as El Dodo Yoga Works. <laughs> we used to fire people when they were on vacation. It was a nice thing to do. <laughs> Not me personally, but that's the way that some of them you know, thought that was pretty nasty. Then. Um, so he had been hired from Tektronix to work at El Dorado, and after a couple of years, he was he, he thought he was going to get some profit sharing, but it didn't happen for him. He, he, they told him he misunderstood. Typical of that company. <laughs> <laughs> so he then went back to work at Tektronix, and it wasn't. It was soon after, not, well, not too soon after, that he, he, he called me and said, Dick, turn around, it's fair play, you want to come and work for us? I said, and by this time things are coming together, you know, wine and grapes and cool climate. And so that's when we took the job and loaded up to incurred that biggest moving bill. Hmm. So when you, moved, when you moved to Oregon, where did you start? Were you in, in the Portland area? Well, we rented a house at Beaverton, uh, which was close enough to work. Uh, but, and at the same time, Tech had a flying club. So at lunchtime, we'd go up and fly in, over the area with a geodetic survey map and look at things that might be good, good, good elevations and exposures to grow grapes. In the meantime, I'd, I'd gone to the, and studied, I'd studied and went down a the main library in, in Portland and I looked up all the weather records I could get my hands on. And, and uh, it seemed that everything on paper said you should be able to grow grapes. Mm -hmm. and, and then we'd fly over these places and then on the weekends I'd take the family car and go out and start knocking on doors. And, and I found out one thing, you, you never ask a farmer, will you sell me part of your ground? It's sort of like an insult. So but I said, no, do you, I said, I have this nursery and it's full of grapevines. I need to find a home for them. And do you know anything around, anything around here where I might be able to you know, plant? And I found a couple places like that. And one place I went back to uh, was on Dopp Road. And uh, Mrs. Dopp was still alive. And it, the, 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 she had about 100 acres. And, the north half of it was up on a slope facing south, and it was great elevation, great exposure. And she said she saw me half, about half of her place, and it, it and it was quite formidable because it it had been a walnut orchard, and the Columbus Day storm had basically killed the orchard and broke off all the tap roots. Uh, so I was faced with clearing it. Uh, and fortunately, she, she had a, 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 a tractor driver that had worked for her all, all, those, all those years. And he, um, he taught me how to farm. I didn't know that much about farming. And we just started clearing the, the walnuts away. And then the Tektronix had a newspaper that came out weekly. And I said, free firewood. And all of a sudden, everyone poured out onto the, and there was like a million chainsaws all running at one time. You ever, you want to hear a bunch of noise? <laughs> Smoke, noise, people cutting up the trees to take, take away. So we got about four acres cleared out enough to plant the, the first 23 varieties I planted. Was, you know, planted Pinot, of course, and uh, Riesling was the other, was a lot of Riesling back in those days. A little bit of Pinot Gris, but it's, it's just as a holding pattern, you know. Because I had 
23 varieties. I couldn't have very many a lot, in four acres. I wouldn't, didn't allow for a very large planting of any single variety. Uh, so those four acres, along with grapes that Jim Marsh had planted, that I got him started planting in 1972, I made a two, the first 216 cases of wine. We have one of those bottles in the archives. Do you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we do. So you mentioned all the, all the varieties. Why plant so many varieties? Well, I, I read this, the book. Uh, uh, there's a, a French amphilographer, uh, Pouillot, who uh, categorized the, the ripening of grapevines in relationship to a single variety that was grown all around Europe, which was Chasseau Doré. Turns out Chasseau Doré is what the old timers in Oregon called Sweetwater. And it, it brought in you know, Llewellyn on the wagon trains or somehow they brought it in from Ohio or wherever. Uh, you don't imagine how these things got here. And uh, the old Cory Vineyard, not his vineyard, but the vineyard across the road from him had, had, had Sweetwater or Chassis growing there. Um, so Pouillot um, defined the ripening of the different grape varieties that were being grown all through Europe with relationship to the Chassis. And so it was like, one day, one week later, two weeks later, whatever the ripening times were. And he put those in the period, periods one, two, three, four, five. And then anything earlier was called precoche. Uh, and and, uh, and precoche would be like Gord Stimulator or something. Mm -hmm. it, but uh, Pinot Noir was period one. And so uh, I think Cabernet period three or something like that. So I had. So I looked at all those varieties that are grown in those different periods, and I said, well, I'll try them out. And not every one of them, obviously, but you know, a few of this and a few of that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and there was, you know, that's back in the days when there was no OSU research. And I remember the extension agent sending people over to see me. <laughs> Help, you know, they want to know what's a plan, so I gave my opinion. <laughs> and that's how it all got started, I guess. Who, you mentioned one of the things you did was knocking on a lot of doors. So who else did you meet that was doing something similar at that point? You mentioned turning Jim Marsh on to, to planting. Who else did you meet in the early days? What were your kind of first Oregon impressions of wine? Oh, wow. Well, what, when I was working at Tech, uh, I was asking the guys that work, what about grapes and wine here? And they, and they uh, uh, there was a, a, a winery in Oregon City that made fruit and berry wines. Um, and I went to visit, I can't remember the name of it. Went to visit and the fellow was sterilizing, he had residual sugar because it's a fruit and berry wine. He was pasteurizing the wine before he bottled it by going through a series of hot water heater coils. One was an enunciated, so ran it to two to get it hot enough to pasteurize and he'd buy. Of course, you can't, that's a good way to ruin wine, you know. So that didn't tell me much. <laughs> but, you know, the only other one that was Richard Summers, because I'd met him at Davis and we were in the same class together. In, it was a class about aging a wine that was being taught by Vern Singleton. Uh, and I, and I, was, I talked to Vern, I said, what do you know about Oregon and, and people planting grapes? He said, well, I said, I said, I had a couple guys through my class here last year, Chuck Corey and Dave Lutt. And he gave me their contact information, but he said, you don't have to go any further, you got the one in the back of the room here. And it was Richard Summers. <laughs> So I introduced myself, and he was very um, enthusiastic that someone would have an interest in Oregon. So he gave me a bottle of his wine that he made. Uh, I, as soon as class was over, you know, to drive from Davis to Walnut Creek was not that hard, and not that far. And I got home and I opened a bottle of wine that he'd given me, and it smelled like whiskey barrels. 
because he's going to Hood River Distilleries and getting the whiskey barrels. Back then, they can we reuse a whiskey barrel? And he was getting the, the used whiskey barrels, bringing them back to his vineyard in Roseburg, not even rinsing them out, and putting wine in there. So obviously, the wine tasted like whiskey a bit. And I said, no, this is not, no, that's not so good. <laughs> but anyhow, you could taste there was some, the fruit flavors were back, hidden back in there behind the whiskey. And I said, well, there's, there's some nice fruit back in there. So that was the first time I had an inkling that there might be a way out of this mess, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned UC Davis. Like we kind of skipped over that part of the story. So you went, you, you went to UC Davis before coming up. So, so tell me about why and, and what, else, what, what else happened there when you were at Davis and your experience there. Well, by that time, I knew I wanted to have a, a winery, and I, so I'd, I had contacted the Wine Institute in California. They were offering uh, uh, access to Davis refresher courses for the industry. And uh, I told them that uh, I didn't have a winery yet, but I was going to have a winery. I didn't tell them it was going to be in Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> So I got, I got, I was able to sign up for the classes, and that first class was in 19, 1967. And I, I met, you know, Andre Chelichev and Martini and all, all the, they were all there around. He learned just as much from the, the classmates as he did from the, the you know, the, lect, the professors that were lecturing. So your professor also told you, as you mentioned, about, about Chuck Corey and about David Lett being up here. So tell me about meeting those guys. Uh, when I came up for that interview uh, to do with Tektronix, um, after, after the interview, I went out to see uh, uh, Chuck. He lived in Forest Grove in, in the old house there. And it turned it just turned into like a four o'clock in the morning marathon. Not talking about nothing about, about wine. Uh, the next day, I, on the way home, is when I stopped in Silverton. Is, I knew that where, that's where Dave Light was living at the time. And uh, he was out selling books, but his, his wife you know, said, I introduced myself. And then uh, when we moved up later, I, I met him later on. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on the way down, that's when I stopped in Roseburg and got grapes and smuggled them into California because you couldn't, you know, there's the, 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 the ag, ag inspection, you know, they, mm -hmm. it's kind of funny because California had every disease known to man already. And now, now they were, now they were saying you can't bring anything more in, you know, sort of kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> so what grapes did you take from Roseburg across the border? Uh, I took a uh, Gewurz because it was nice and ripe. Uh, I took uh, I took Riesling. It wasn't so ripe. <laughs> but uh, you know, I made the wine in the garage again in the garage in Walnut Creek. Garages and winemaking are synonymous with me. You know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> So at this point, you already, you already, you, you've now you've we're coming back to you've you've got your land, you've you've cleared it, uh, you've got your varietals planted. What's the next step for you? What what? How do you start building toward having a winery and and, and, and producing commercial wine? Well, you have to have water. Kind of you know, and coming from California and knowing that Oregon rains a lot, I figured it should be easy to get water. So there's a thing called an aquifer. I found out the hard way I didn't have one. <laughs> so at, the, at that, that same place where the old walnut orchard was, drilled a dry hole, basically 300 feet, and no water. So what are you gonna do? Uh, and about that time, um, a fellow by the name of Jack Potter Carey was working for the uh, Oregon Economic Development Commission uh, had had heard about, I don't know how he found this out, he heard about me, Chuck, and Dave, and Richard Summers that were planted before us, were the only ones in the state at the time that had any grapes in the ground. And he, he interviewed all four of us. 
and he wrote he wrote a paper. We get that paper. He should have that in the library. Uh, this is kind of a pivotal it's a pivotal paper in its sense that where the you know the government got inter involved or at least aware that there could be a wine industry here, and that's what his paper was about. So my my partner to be at the time, Cal Knudsen, is a warehouser and he's in charge of real estate and he, he knows and he loves wine. He loved particularly champagne, so sparkling wine. Um, he, he reads this art, he reads a, the, the Potter Carey uh, two page, whatever, flyer, whatever it was. And he calls all four of us up and writes his letter and said, would you uh, would you be willing to sell me some grapes? I want to, you know, want to start a, a sparkling wine operation. And I don't know what the other people told him, but I said, "Thanks for your, you know, interest, but I need the grapes for my own wine." So, some time went past, and my secretary at work said, "Dick, you got a call," and it was Cal, and he said, "Can we talk?" Yes, sure, he, he drove down from, I think he was still living in Portland at the time. And so we, we met out at this old logger's cabin that I was living at in, on King's Grave Road. It, by the way, was there until like a few years ago. What a place. <laughs> Kids thought it was wonderful. I can imagine. You know, get on a tricycle and you go downhill and it just went by itself. He didn't have to pedal. He crashed into the stove at the other end. <laughs> so he said, I've got this piece of land and I want to plant grapes and can you help me out? And we, so we, we made a deal where um, I, I was in charge of putting his vineyard in and at the same time now I could farm my place not just on weekends we could share equipment together. We wasn't that far apart. We could drive a tractor back and forth, and uh, and that's how how we got started, uh, you know, together. Mm -hmm. And then night we finally formed a partnership in 1975, mm -hmm. and we were partners until 1988. So. So you mentioned that 1972 was your first fit vintage for sale. Yeah, yeah. Where did you make it? Where, 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 where were you making wine at this point? We just moved into the house that we built on at Knudsen Vineyards. And the house was, uh, uh, I built the basement big enough to put barrels for the doors and things. And, uh, and made the 216 cases of wine in the basement of the house. I think that the picture in the, the, the book, The Boys of North, shows a picture of that first vintage. You know, a barrel, a couple carboys, and that was it. So I'm curious about the, about when you, from, from the first vineyard you, vineyard you planted with all the different varietals, to then working with Cal on his vineyard, what changed for you? Did you, I assume you honed in on some varietals at that point. Why, how did you plant this, that, that vineyard and, and why did you choose what you chose? Well, I, th I think I, that we knew at the outset that, that Riesling and Pinot Noir and Chardonnay would be important varieties. Um, the problem with Chardonnay back then was is that you couldn't get uh, virus-free material from California unless you got the, what we call the the um, clone that came out of uh, 105, one, one. I'll remember the clone here in a minute. Uh, the Chardonnay one, one, don't remember the clone. It's the one that's being extensively planted in California because it was chosen by Dr. Olmo and it had very large uh, clusters. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of yield. Uh, it, it took forever to ripen in Oregon, and we really didn't get a, a real good breakthrough in Chardonnay until we got some of the Dijon clones in much later in '88. Uh, 
so it was, it was on the, from the Louis Martini ranches where that 108, the 108 clone from Louis Martini. Almost, I think, you know, it was great for California, but mm -hmm. it didn't, didn't work very well for him. Mm -hmm. So, so we ran with as hard as we could with Pino, and then, and, and Riesling almost was. Riesling's an interesting variety because it, uh, it, uh, it doesn't ripen that easily, but it has good flavors at low sugar levels, and it has such great acidity mm -hmm. that it lasts a real long time in a bottle. I had opened one the other day, which was a 77, and it was still alive, still alive and kicking. Amazing. So that we, that's how we, you know, focused in on, uh, and Pino was the, the big issue, and, and I think uh, we didn't know about clones back then. And we, we uh, when we, getting cold? <laughs> When, when we, um, we got to thinking about this, they do all these different varieties. Why do you have you know, clones? Well, clones, I always explain clones as like you have a family of kids. Maybe you got a big family, like Pino has a big family. And you got some that are good and some are bad and some indifferent, you know. So which clone are you going to use? You have to find the clone that works works best for the your for the environment, I guess. And that's when the Dijon material came in. It's and it's and it's still being used quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But there are other clones. It's just the good old pomard, the stuff that we started out with, is makes nice wine. So as as after you got here and other people started to show up and, and do kind of what you were doing, tell me about the early days of the industry and of, of the collaboration that was going on in terms of finding the right clones, finding the right material. Uh, how, how was the industry growing? Well, that, the way that clonal thing started then is that uh, I had met Dr. Austin Goheen when I was at Davis taking classes and he was a biology, USDA biologist out of Bethesda, Maryland, but he was headquartered at Davis. And he was in charge of all their virus programs there. And, and so I said, Austin, we need, we need, we need you. <laughs> we, need, we need some help. Uh, uh, what, we need different clones to see how they work in, in Oregon. And, you know, they've been checked in California, but that doesn't tell us anything about what they're going to do in Oregon. Mm -hmm. So he sent to OSU a lot of material uh, that, uh, that OSU then planted. Um, and then from that point on, then Dave Adelsheim went to, to France and took up the reins on that search for more, more clones. And that's how he got hooked in to, to bring the Dijon clones in. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of, you know, one, one thing we all help to get to make that happen with that specifically working working with the French to, I, I, tell me about that relationship building a relationship with the Burgundian winemakers of the time uh, I wasn't I was not doing the clonal thing Dave was because mm -hmm. that came after I went to in Burgundy in 1977 and uh, and that's when I found out I was doing the right thing you know you have that moment that like, okay, the defining moment, we were with Becky Wasserman, and she was just starting her export business because the small guy in Burgundy wasn't getting to the United States with his wine. So we were going to the small producers, tasting their wine, tasting two or three in the morning and then having a great lunch afterwards. And I can't remember where we were, but I remember tasting wine out of the barrel and said, Oh man, this is just like Oregon. I said, we got it. This is it. Hallelujah. You know, be nice to you know that you finally did something right. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about selling wine in those days. Uh, about finding consumers for wine, and, and 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 what kind of education did you have to do for consumers of wine? 
Well, the first thing he had to do in Oregon was tell them that this was wine made from grapes. It wasn't from blackberries, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't from raspberries. And, and that was the first hurdle. I think for quite a few years, you know, fruit and berry wines actually outsold grape wines here. Uh, and then to go out of state was another, you know, we were, I think, I can't remember what year it was, 80, in the 80s some, at some point, we, the Oregon consumers were loyal, and, but the production was increasing and stressing their loyalty. So we had, we had to start selling wine out of state. And uh, that's where Steve Carey came in. Mm -hmm. uh, we would do our, our uh, guerrilla marketing, you know. It was back before the days of sec airplane security. We would st make a midnight stop in Chicago, meet somebody on the tar tarmac and give them some wine, take off again, and hit, go next stop was New Jersey, put some wine in this guy's garage. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, it was guerrilla marketing the number. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about the growth of, of Erath, the brand. So obviously you mentioned you started with 200 cases in your garage. Uh, tell me about the growth into into a larger brand and what kind of, were there milestones along the way that you remember vividly? We were, we, we had a lot of grapes coming online, especially from Cal's Vineyard, big, large vineyard. And we knew we had to gear up for, you know, to get, get, get this wine out to the consumer. It was, it was, a, it was a struggle. I mean, it had, uh, took me, at the time when I, you know, I sold the winery to St. Michelle in 20, 2006, I, I'd taken about 20 years to establish a marketing people, distributors across the United States. So it, it didn't come easily to get the wine out there. Because the trouble with distributors, they're either, the ones that have the money are really huge. And they just, they, they just, they're interested in selling boxes. The ones that don't have so much money and love your wine, you know, they don't have, they can't afford to buy your wine. I mean, they can't, they can't, they can't handle much inventory. Mm -hmm. So that had, that hurdle had to be overcome. Um, we started doing one and a half liter bottling. Uh, we don't do that anymore. Uh, that that doubles your. Output right away. <laughs> Don't make much money, but you get the you get the cash flow moving and mm -hmm. pay the overhead. Uh, and then once you have a, the, the uh, critical mass, I call it, to get into Safeways and Fred Meyer's, uh, that's a big jump mm -hmm. where you can start selling a lot of wine. Then what we did is we had we always looked at our marketing as a pyramid. Uh, the bottom le level was a, what we would call uh, what Leon Leon Adams, was, the wine writer from California, would say: uh, everyday wine, Monday Monday through Friday wine, and then he had Sunday wines, and and those were on the top of the pyramid. So we always had a lot of wines at the lower level of the pyramid and as you as we went up in in uh, in, in quality and up and price uh, we went from a regular vintage to a vintage select to a reserve to a single vineyard mm -hmm. so we had four different strata there that we that we could work with i think it worked all right mm -hmm. and the other way around now that people are just starting at the top there's nothing underneath them. Mm -hmm. It's tough, you know. You got you have to get a following, and people mm -hmm. getting distribution now is. I mean, most. I think a lot. I'm not. I don't have any numbers, but I would think a lot of Oregon wineries now are of the size that distributors don't want to 
have them and they have to sell on premise mm -hmm. and through uh, events and mm -hmm. you know maybe maybe you have different followings in, in different parts of the country that someone's fallen in love with you and they'll take your wine. What were the biggest challenges in terms of scaling up both the, vit the viticulture part of things and the winemaking part of things? As you grew, what were the biggest challenges for you? Um, having enough fermentation space. We started in that, the garage, in the basement of the house, and already in, by 1974, the, uh, the basement wasn't big enough. And, Tanks were sitting out on the apron in front of the house. And in 75, that wasn't gonna work anymore either. So we, we kicked the tractors out of the tractor shed down below and moved into the tractor shed, made that a winery. And then finally, that's gonna out, outgrew that. And in 76, we actually built a winery. That actually, you know, put tanks in and and had some semblance of efficiency. <laughs> <laughs> so, it took a while. What about on the, on the vineyard side of things? Was there, were there, from what you initially planted, what, were there any big changes in terms of spacing, in terms of trellising, in terms of any of that, at, at, as, you, as you grew and expanded? I went, uh, in 77, I went to Europe and I spent six weeks there and I went through all the major wine growing areas. And one thing I saw there was the, the use of catch wires, tighter spacing of course, and catch wires. So we're, we didn't, we knew that the grapes in Oregon needed maximum exposure. You want to expose the leaves to the sun uh, for maximum photo, uh, photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. Uh, whereas in California, they have everything drape over, they won't want to prevent sunburn, too much sun. So that, and, and we weren't going to do that. So at that, before we had catch wires, we just had simple three wires and, and let, and we just let them kind of find it, help them find their way up through there. So the catch wires were a great innovation that the Europeans had mm -hmm. that I imported back to Oregon. And everyone uses that now in multiple stations and moving the wires up. Uh, and then more recently, uh, tighter spacings. Mm -hmm. um, I, for me, the jury's out on too tight a spacing because our soils are so deep here. And Burgundy, uh, Burgundy, a good soil is about a foot deep. You know, and, uh, it's uh, tighter spacings. I'm, I'm, I think I think that some vineyards have been actually changed out because they were too tight. Mm -hmm. so, you know, you have to probably find the right. You know, the thing about vineyards is that you, 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 the, 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 you want to do an experiment. It takes a long time to find out if you're doing things right or wrong because you have to do it on an annual growth cycle, right? Mm -hmm. So you got to live to be old. <laughs> Not for a young guy. You mentioned um, the the kind of the advent of, of Oregon State as a, as a research partner in, in the in the industry. I'm I'm curious, from your recollection, what were some of the biggest issues that Oregon viticulture was facing that were sort of helped along by the research process? What 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 obstacles were you facing that needed to be overcome? We wanted to get Oregon State on board, and we. We, we, and Dr. Ralph Guerin was head of Small Fruits at the time, and, and uh, he, he uh, jumped in and we said, Ralph, we need to do a phenological study. We need to plant these different, like I was doing at the original vineyard, we need to plant these different period grapes all around the state. And, uh, and we did. And most of them have been abandoned by now. But, uh, that got OSU involved, and and uh, and I think they you know 
obviously now we, we have an Oregon Winery Research Institute, so it's come right along. And you guys are doing a little more here in Linfield too now, right? Every little bit, yeah. every little bit we can. So, as you started making wine, did you have a what you consider like a winemaking philosophy or, or a style that you were that you were was there something you were going for in the wine and, and did that change in your career making wine? Um, never changed. I always I, I always some people make wine because they want to please their own palate. I make. I tried to make wine that I thought would please the most, most number of palates. And, uh, and I think that paid off. I mean, uh, that you shouldn't have to explain the wine. The wine should speak for itself. Uh, you talk about, we talk about some of the other challenges. So tell me about, um, Phylloxera and, and its arrival in Oregon and, and what you had to do uh, in your vineyards to deal with it. The philosophy? Ph Phylloxera. Oh, Phylloxera. Um, at, at the outset, we thought, well, we could maybe, we originally planted grapes on our own roots because we thought there was no Phylloxera here. And maybe there wasn't. You know, if there was, it was on old Concord plantings that we didn't have, you know, we could stay away from those. Mm -hmm. Phlox is a funny little critter. It, it moves around with no one knowing about it. Mm -hmm. We're not, I'm not sure, that there have been several theories on how we got it here. Uh, it's, you know, you just serve them. Back in the days, we were buying grapes from Washington, and uh, Washington has a substantial amount of phlox doesn't bother the vines so much because the soils are so sandy. Uh, but back to the when we were starting up here, uh, we we would buy grapes from Washington. A different winery would buy grapes from Washington. A truckload of would arrive at the winery. You'd offload them, dump the grapes, and you have the empty boxes sitting around. Well, some of us used those empty boxes, took them out in our vineyards. And I think that's one way we maybe brought, introduced Washington, Washington philosophy in. Don't know that for sure. But it seems like knowing where some flocks are jumped up and knowing that those boxes were there, that was the only correlation. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, and then I know that we had, um, we had animals, you know, dogs, probably dogs more than deer, you know, moving up across, you know, everyone usually in the, has a dog, you know. Uh, I know one year we had uh, the, the uh, Thanksgiving weekend and it was, had been postponed because of um, a big snowstorm and some people had driven up uh, from California in their pickup truck I met them at, at Gary Fuquay's vineyard, mm -hmm. and uh, there was mud on their on their tires, and they come out of their vineyard in California. And Gary was one of the first ones to have established. He holds the, the, the I have the first phylloxera. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. It's uh, how it got around. How did, how did you handle it once it was there? Um, we tried some systemic uh, bear had bear had in, invented a, a an insecticide that would go down to the roots, and a bit it, apparently it works, but very slowly and very expensive. So that was abandoned, and, and then we we then started going with the grafted stock because now you have, there's some control over the, the uh, growth cycle of the wine. You can shorten it, and, which is probably a good thing. So basically, I think everyone's using rootstock now. I mean, after he's, he's, you're spending a lot of money now for a grafted vine, 
it wasn't like an own rooted vine, which you could produce very inexpensively. Mm -hmm. The grafted vine is a lot, a lot of cost involved because all that processing mm -hmm. that it goes to make a grafted vine. In the earlier days, where was your plant material coming from? Where, where were you getting cuttings to, to plant in the vineyards here? Um, early on, we got it. Uh, I got my cuttings from Carl Wente, who, who was, uh, had an uh, increased block in Greenfield, California. It was an increased block under the California certification program. And that's where we got uh, um, a lot of the Pinot Noir from him. Interestingly enough, he had gone to the University of Oregon. So I'd met him before I came up here and he was pretty supportive. He, he thought that was a great thing to do to come to Oregon and start planting grapes. And at the same time, I, having been in the Navy and uh, uh, Barney Fetzer was also in the Navy, we were talking about putting up a winery together in California. Then we kind of finally decided a ship can only have one captain. Yeah. So, but we, we, I got a lot of plant material from him. Uh, uh, Pinot Meunier, basically, we got from him. So that early on, that's, and then we, we, I, we would buy from, uh, there were increased blocks, more and more increased blocks in California that sold Full material, mm -hmm. and we use we use those those sources. And for I think you can get we got some material from Oregon State too, smaller quantities. So you talked earlier about um, sort of the '80s and and the brand Oregon idea of, of selling, getting wine outside of Oregon and, and into other people's hands. I'm curious from your perspective, are, what are the sort of the benchmark moments for the industry that you can remember where, where, where things, big moments for the Oregon wine, that, that, things that happen that move the industry forward? What, what were some of the seminal moments for, for, in your mind for the industry? Well, there was a classic tasting in New York City of, of the 83 Pinots. It went up against the 83 Burgundies. And the, the people, the tasting there, almost one, without exception, thought that the Oregons were Burgundies and vice versa because the wines were so much better mm -hmm. for that vintage anyhow. And that was a big breakthrough. And then that, that, that tasting was replicated across at, at different places across the United States and it held up, the results held, held up across it was. And you know, then the big, the wine writers started to say, hey, Oregon's got something going for itself. So the press, the press start. I think Oregon wines have gotten more, pre more press per bottle than any other area. <laughs> you know. I mean, we look at it, you know, California to the south and Washington to the north. We're the, we're the rose between two thorns, right? <laughs> what about after that? What were, the, were there other big moments that, that stand out in your memory? Tasting that was done with Dave Lutz wine back in in in, in France was a mm -hmm. great great eye opener for a lot of people. I think um, I'm probably forgetting some major ones here. What about what about when the Druins came to Oregon? What was your what was your kind of reaction to that? Uh, when Druin came, mm -hmm. uh, that was another one of those stamp of approvals. You know, it was like. It was, I remember Bill, Bill the first wines were not made in, in the existing winery, they were made at, at Chehalem. And uh, then he brought the wine over to the existing winery and they had a grand opening and, he, and Robert invited all the winemakers there. And I was standing next to Bill Fuller and we were tasting the wine and, and I said, you know, it smells like an Oregon wine. If it smelled like Burgundy, I'd kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
I remember that. That was, and I, you know, I, I, and I think they've done a great job here too in, in helping them. You know, look at all the French guys that have followed their footprints that have come now. There are more French guys coming here than there are California guys coming here. Yeah, it's true. You had talked earlier about uh, the critical mass of sales, of getting, getting yourself onto Safeways and Fred Meyer shelves. How long did it take you to, to kind of reach critical mass with, with Erath sales? And what, what was it like seeing your wine kind of on, on those kind of store shelves? Um, I don't know if there's anyone yet. 70, trying to think what year. It was in the early 80s, I remember, and you know, we started getting authorizations, you know, where we could, that was back in the day when like Safeway had a central warehouse. And so your wine went to that central warehouse and it went to every Safeway store in the state of Oregon. There's a lot of boxes of wine getting moved that way. Uh, so, yeah, it, uh, I don't remember what year that was. But now it's, Central warehousing is not allowed anymore, but you don't need it. It, 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 it amazes me that uh, early on, you would never find an Oregon wine in a restaurant. And now you can't find a restaurant without Oregon wine, right? It, everyone has to have a bottle of good Oregon wine. So tell us about the decision to sell Erath. I, I know you mentioned earlier Chateau Saint Michel in, in uh, 2006. What went into the decision, and, and why why them? Why did you choose to sell to them? Um, they uh, <clears throat> they were also <clears throat> was Columbia distributing at the time, and they were using Columbia, and so was I. So I and uh, so I knew Saint Michel pretty well. And I knew some, a lot of the people who worked there. Uh, and so they, uh, they, they approached me and, and would you like to, we don't have any Pinot you know, in our portfolio. And we had the volume that they were looking for and we had the Pinot they were looking for. And, and uh, so it was, a, and they, I think at the time Ted Basler was the president. And he said, Dick, you know, we've had a good year last year. We have some bucks in our pocket. <laughs> so we, we struck a deal that was back in 06. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the, the first thing you sold, but you also sold, eventually sold Vineyard as well. So tell me about the, the, other, the other deal with, with Toomey and how that came about. Well, yeah, the, 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 with Saint Michel, I didn't sell any vineyards at all. It's just the, the, the facilities, the brand, mm -hmm. and then with uh, finally in the in the, um, I could see that I'm not going to be driving a tractor too much more, and, uh, and started started to uh, look for ways to sell the vineyard, and uh, and they appeared on the scene. And uh, they had a lot of money. <laughs> um, the, one of the appraisers here in, in Oregon, out of Salem, who's, does appraisal work for, uh, for who's most respected, mm -hmm. Carl Stillman, the most well-known appraiser. Um, he said, Dick, can I use that number? I said, you better not. <laughs> Going to throw everything on a contact. So uh, they, they uh, the Tume and Silver Oak have, a, they have tons of money behind them. Mm -hmm. Don't know where they. I don't think they're printing it, but they're getting it somewhere. <laughs> you talked earlier about uh, the boys up north. Uh, t tell me about the the, the decision to, to write a book and and the, the process for of writing that book for you. Uh, back in the in the day, we had a marketing company uh, out of Portland, and they they wanted to write a book, and so uh, and they got a, 
they got the author uh, who has since passed. Uh, what was his name? Uh, remember his name? I don't remember off the top of my head, no. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't remember either. So he did a series of interviews. And he would never take notes. Like you, you're taking notes, right? He wasn't taking any notes. I said, how can this guy write a book? He had an incredible memory, so he wrote a book that was pretty accurate. What was, with the final product, what, what was important to you be represented in the book? What, what did you want to make sure was clear from, from that book? The, the title of the book, The Boys Up North, was Richard Summers' idea, uh, which is kind of interesting. And, uh, and it basically talks about the early days and what we were doing. And, uh, I think it came off pretty well in that regard. We weren't, weren't trying to you know, write a Pulitzer Prize. But it had, to be, it had to be important to you that people take something away from it. Was there something about the early days of Oregon wine that you were hoping people would get from the, from the story? Oh, the, the, the uh, collaboration, I think, is the main thing. I mean, we look back over how fast we have evolved the Oregon industry. Yeah. And it's because of the collaboration. We had, we, we would collaborate with one another loan equipment back and forth, whatever, you know, to make ends meet. Um, and it, but we may have different distributors, and the different distributors would fight over it. They would fight, and we were kind of embarrassed, like, well, we didn't know we knew. Well, I like his wine, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> com they were competitive, and we weren't. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. We mentioned that collab that collaboration. Um, what were some of the biggest things that came out of that for the industry? What were some of the biggest things that you collaborated on to move the industry forward? Well, I think the labeling laws. That was a collaboration of uh, I think there were six or seven of us early on that, that promulgated uh, those laws. You know, uh, and and basically, we it was easy to do with the Liquor Control Commission because we were policing ourselves, so to speak. You know, uh, and why was it important to you? Why were the labeling, labeling laws specifically important? Well, because I think it, it, uh, it made sure that there was truth in, that what you saw in a label was actually true. Mm -hmm. you know, that, uh, and I guess recently there's been some ups and downs about that with the grapes going to California. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I'm not involved in that anymore. <laughs> someone, yeah. someone else's fight now, though. Not, not your fight anymore. Not my fight anymore. <laughs> so, and I guess it's the fight. Is the fight going, still going on? Yeah. In, in ways, yeah. Yeah, in, in different ways. ways. So I thought you know, it was important back then. Uh, the law, the federal law, was if you said it was Cabernet, it only had to be 51 percent. And in Oregon, we had to be 90 percent. So, and then if if it said Yamhill County, the grapes had to be from Yamhill County. You know, no, no, 100 percent. And those those were pretty tough. You know, not tough because they were in a way they were easy for us because we knew what we were doing. We were bringing in fruit from Russia. Were there people who resisted that in the industry? Were there people who did not want those labeling laws? Uh, not at that time. I don't think that we were that at the, you know, I don't know. When did those, do you know what year those went yeah, through? Like 81? Something, something like that, yeah. yeah. I don't right think there, you know, you look at the number of wineries then, and I, and I think it was, I think it was, not, you couldn't do it now, I don't think. There's too many diverse interests now. Mm -hmm. But I'm sort of happy that we got it through. And then since that time, the federal law has stiffened up a bit too. Mm -hmm. 
So when we do these interviews, we always, we always like to ask people about the changes they've seen in the industry, but, but it's kind of a tough question to ask you because you've seen the whole industry grow. So I'm curious, instead of asking that, if there are, as you look at Oregon wine industry now or, or recently, what, what, in the ways it's evolved, what makes you happiest? What, what, as you look at the industry now, what, what are you most pleased about from Oregon wine? Well, I'm, I'm glad it, it, it's, it's so successful. I mean, I think it makes, you know, that the, those early thoughts that we had, you know, when we were making 216 cases of wine, is this really gonna work? You know? And it, it has worked, and that's, uh, it's an endorsement of the, what we were doing early on. Mm -hmm. uh, and now the, you know, the I'm sure it's going through growing pains now. I mean, you know, it's, it's a different level. Of, you know, the, it's um, how many cases I don't know what, what Oregon producing now, but it's a big number. So. It's a big number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, you've you've hired and, and trained and, and mentored a lot of people in the Oregon wine industry who, who are still in it. I'm curious, as you look at people who've come through Erath over the years and are now successful. How does it make you feel to, to kind of see people that came up with you uh, off doing their own thing now in Oregon Wine? A lot of the guys now have their own wineries. And uh, I just mentioned, she should have mentioned that, it was about a week ago, I was having lunch at the Red Hill Market and Rich Cushman walks in and, and, he, you know, and he worked for me. My first job out of school was working, working for me. So we sat down and, you know, and had lunch together. And it's kind of nice to have those those encounters with guys that you know that that that, that work for you and then done they've gone off on their own and done done a nice job. Mm -hmm. So you're obviously uh, uh, often called one of the Oregon wine pioneers. I'm, I'm curious what if you if, if someone calls you an Oregon wine pioneer, what, what does it mean to you to be called that? How do you react to, to being called something like that? I don't understand the word pioneer very well. Um, you, could, you know, you could be a pioneer and be an absolute failure. <laughs> you know, it just means you were doing something early on, right? Right or wrong. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I it's hard to, hard to answer. I don't like, I like, I like, well, what's really interesting and a little reflect upon myself is that how many people in the world can go to a place and start a new industry where there wasn't one before? And, you know, I mean, it's not like, oh, I'm gonna go to McMinnville because they need more nails and I'm gonna start a nail factory because they, I see a market for more nails. Well, there was nothing like that. There was no market for Oregon wine. We made the market for Oregon wine. We, we actually built an industry where there wasn't one before. And I, I, I find that very gratifying. Not, who can do that? Not I mean, many. You know. So you mentioned that even after even after you sold, you kept making wine. So I'm curious about your post Erath brand wine adventures and and and, and up, up into 2019. What were you still doing at that point? At which at what time? What, after you sold Erath the brand, what were you still doing? You still were making wine at that point. So I'm curious about kind of your other wine ventures uh, here and elsewhere. Well, I I had the little. I started a little industry down in Arizona. Mm -hmm. tell, us, tell me about that. Uh, I used to spend a lot of winters down there playing golf, but then there's only so much golf you can play. <laughs> and then uh, I asked them about the, the university. I said, you have any grapes growing around here? And they said, well, this is in Tucson and the University of Arizona had a test block in Tucson in town probably the hottest place in town. And, and the, the grapes were like, get me out of here, I'm cooking. <laughs> and and uh, then I, I met the fellow who not, 
who wasn't living too far from me, who had, he was the owner of the uh, Volvo dealership in town. His kids are running it now. He, um, and he had planted some grapes in his backyard. And I planted some in my backyard in Tucson, too. Of course, I was never there to harvest them. <laughs> Something else also I harvested them. I mean, talk about bugs. There was a, a skeletonizer type of caterpillar I've never seen before. One day the vine is there and leaves and everything, the next day there's no leaves. It just eat, took, just took the leaves right off. And so, if, you know, every place, on, wherever you can grow grapes, you're gonna find your, some problems. There's some mother nature's gonna have some surprise for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we, and, and so I started planting this vineyard down near, uh, it's called Dos Cabezas. And it's out of Wilcox, south of Wilcox. Um, and it, uh, it's on the limestone soil. So everyone says, yeah, they have limestone. Well, we got limestone. Need rattlesnakes? We got rattlesnakes. <laughs> Don't need rattlesnakes. <laughs> um, and <laughs> so, you know, we plant this vineyard and it grows really fine. And, uh, and I'm down there at that time. That winter, uh, early winter, I'm not down there. Uh, and I, I go down, at, they have a monsoon season there. And the fellow that was in charge of watering a place after the monsoons and the leaves are off, decided, well, you don't need water anymore. Bad news. Grapevines need water all the time. So they, uh, I got you know, beautiful vines. I had like 23% loss. Mm. They all froze back, they didn't come back. Uh, so you, you learn, you know, you have to water them all the time. Then, you, then everything grows there. Um, we grow a lot of Portuguese, Spanish, Italian varieties. The, um, and they all do well. And, but, when the ripening time comes, which is earlier than here, substantially earlier than here, we start harvesting down there uh, towards the end of July. Oh my God. And, and then with some late varieties, uh, you don't finish until end of September. Uh, but the, with, with the monsoons, you've got these grapes hanging there. They look wonderful. From, you know, they look like you can just walk right up to them from here to that wall. And but the, the rain has hit them and you get what's called a dry rot. Mm -hmm. And you, the, the cluster looks fine. You can get up to it, there's nothing in it. It's gone. And so you have to find varieties that will withstand rain. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, ones that have loose clusters, the water can go through and and drain, drain out uh, is important. And then we actually have to, the fruit set is so wonderful down there with perfect conditions for fruit set. We decided we had to interfere with that. And we went out, we sprayed cold water on the grapes at bloom. And that cut the set back so we had loosened the clusters up a little bit. It's, it's just opposite from here, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. so, uh, And, and no rattlesnakes up here. No, no. Thank, thankfully, no. <laughs> That's a very different terroir there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you, you mentioned that 2019 was, was when you gave it up. What, what finally made you decide to, to give up uh, on winemaking? Well, I was, I was living in Vancouver now and I, and I had to come back to, to Dundee where the neighbor I, I have all my, moved all my winemaking equipment down to her house. Sophia's place, mm -hmm. and uh, still there, and uh, and uh, I think she wants to make wine this year. We we'll have to talk about that. So, but in the meantime, I find that there's a group of winemaking wine, wineries and winemaker grape growers in Clark County. It's called, and they call themselves the Southwest Washington Wineries Association. And we have Zoom meetings once a, quite 
once, at least once a month. Um, and they don't want to plant Pinot. I said, you can plant Pinot here. It's getting warmer and, you know, it'll, it'll go. No, you guys in Oregon, they, you know, we can't compete. You know, we don't want to be second fiddle. So they're looking, they're looking for ways what they, what they can do. Some wineries are getting grapes from uh, Eastern Washington, bring them in. Not, that's cheating. So I'm trying to, right now I'm trying to get them to plant varieties that, uh, like Miller Turgau, which, which should do really well there. It does really well in northern Switzerland. Uh, and tr try to get them to think, uh, work with the climate they have to find the best variety to fit. Always looking for a fit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then in, they haven't even, no, I'm not meaning this as a criticism, but they're, they want to have an AVA. And the jury's out on what they're going to call it. And so, uh, you know, those are fundamental things, the hurdles that they have to overcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all things you've seen a time or two before. Yeah, I've seen them. <laughs> You've, you've seen you've seen all the growth and, and change in Oregon wine. I'm I'm curious as you look ahead for the industry here. What what do you see as you look ahead? What are the what are the biggest challenges that Oregon has to face, and what are some of the the, the good things coming down the road? You hope. Well, I think the, the what I see as an outsider now is is how do you manage the growth, or or can you even manage the growth? You don't want to have to be like a Highway 29 in Napa Valley where you you can't even move. Everything gets plugged up. So, fortunately, the Willamette Valley is a big place, and 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 so I was looking at the numbers. You know, California is huge in terms of acreage. I think three hundred thousand acres or something. But the places that they really grow, like Napa Valley, I think it's thirty thousand acres. Sonoma is forty thousand. Well, we're already we're close to those numbers now here in, in Oregon, and we can we can exceed those numbers easily because we have a much larger geographical area to work with. Uh, it may be, may come the day where where Oregon is viewed in the United States as the best place for really high quality wines. Don't know how far away. I can't say that now. I don't think, but might be able to say that one these days. Mm -hmm. Does Pinot Noir have a strong future here, or is it going to get too warm for the Pinot Noirs that we've made previously? Good question. I don't know how much warmer it's going to get. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, Greg Jones, who I've seen his climate stuff over the years, and he's on my board and. Greg said, even though the, the warming, has, it, 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 we haven't seen the brunt of it like other places in the world have, uh, like Portugal and those places. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe it's, just, it's, maybe it's just a matter of time it's going to catch up with us here in Oregon. <coughs> so good question of Pinot will have to move north, Vancouver. <laughs> I know. I left the house this morning. It was raining. Mm -hmm. so. Spring in the valley here too. Yeah. Uh, um, what about for you? I, I know you're, you're. You said you're up in Vancouver now. Uh, what are you looking forward to? Any any, any fun plans in the future? Any any wine related things in the future, or uh, anything you're looking forward to? Well, you know, wine is made with yeast, and so is bread. So you. I've been doing what's called tartine bread. So I start cultures in my house and I started making bread in my house. And it's simple, right? Just flour and water gets complicated from there on. You know, to get, 
I'm now finding the role of gluten and, and how critical it is. Uh, and then I, you know, you got to have the right thing that you have. I don't have an outside oven like they would, mm -hmm. which you normally would use. So you have to somehow. They now sell a thing, a big cast iron thing for a couple hundred bucks. That you make your bread in that, and, and you got to you got to preheat it to 500 degrees. Then you got to open it up and put the bread in at 500 degrees. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> And, but so I'm, I'm already thinking what I'm, I'm on. I, I started a log on all of my bread making. So I entered number 50 just the other day. So, so I'm, now I'm thinking about what number 51 is going to be. Because I know I learned something from number 50. So I'm going to try to you know, incorporate that into number 51. So this is just your winemaking process all over again. Yeah. Complete, complete with journal. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> and more chemistry, apparently, too. So yeah. you can't get away from that. You can't move from chemistry. I actually have to use it. I'm actually using a pH meter to help me out on this whole process. Well, Dick, that's all the questions that I have for you today. Uh, is there anything that we didn't talk about that we should have talked about? Obviously, we, there's a lot to cover. But did, did I miss anything important? Uh, probably when I get in the car, I can tell you all about it. <laughs> we'll send you with a little recorder. You can, just, you can just talk to it. Yeah, that'd be uh, good. Well, I, don't, I mean, I think you did a great job. You covered a lot of stuff. That's the, those two made the questions, so you can, uh, you, yeah, can okay. you can congratulate them or, or complain to them if you want to. Too. Okay. That's fine too. Well, Dick, thank you so much uh, for your interview today and for, of course, supporting us from the beginning. Uh, one of our initial collections in the archives is from you, and now maybe our biggest collection is from you as well. So uh, we appreciate that. We appreciate you coming down and spending some time with us today and all the support over the years, and we'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Oh, thank you, Rich.